Welcome everyone to the final episode of the Common Room Podcast. The Common Room Podcast explores various stories from people around the world. This season we're exploring students and graduates and we're asking them their stories in relation to the environment, what they think about environmentalism, and if they identify as environmentalists. So let's get into the episode. We have again a very, very, very special guest since it's the finale episode. Cameron Humphrey, who I stalked on LinkedIn for a very long time before uh, finally reaching out to him to be on our podcast. Welcome, Cameron. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. This is, this is really <laughs> cool, so I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. Did you find it weird when you got a random message from me on LinkedIn? <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't necessarily find it weird because it's not the first time I've gotten random messages on LinkedIn. I, I get random messages all the time from people who you know, either want to, you know, talk or chat about a certain thing that I've been through, uh, you know, academically, um, or, you know, you know, people who want to know more about a certain experience uh, that I've that I've witnessed, um, or, you know, how it was when I was in graduate school or something like that. So it wasn't weird at all. But uh, this was the <laughs> first time I got uh, contacted via LinkedIn to do a podcast. So that was, you know, really, really, it was interesting in that regard, and really cool to see. Yeah. yeah, nice, nice. Yeah, so uh, for everyone <coughs> listening in, Cameron actually went to Yale, to the Yale School of the Environment for his uh, graduate yeah. degree. And I guess that's why a lot of people slide into your LinkedIn DMs. <laughs> um, From time to time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, well, we're going to learn a bit more about you in a second. Um, but what I wanted, what I like to start with is to start with a little rapid fire round where I just ask you five co- random questions so that people can just learn a little bit about your fun self okay. <laughs> um okay Seriously. and uh, no pressure just uh just tell us what you think that com- the first thing that comes to your head okay, okay um if you could choose one song to describe your childhood what would it be or not necessarily describe your childhood but like the song of your childhood that you maybe listen to repeatedly or that you reminisce about <laughs> for my childhood um okay I would say a song I would remember from my childhood that I probably reminisce about, and it's actually a song that I listen to ever so often just to remind myself of times back then, I guess. Uh, have you ever heard the song I'm On One by DJ Khaled? I think it was featuring like Drake and Rick Ross and a, a few other uh, rappers and stuff like that. But when I was in, I think, I want to say either middle school or high school, that was a really big song. And okay. uh, that's one of the songs I can really sing like word for word, like, you know, everyone's part. So I might ask you to do that. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I could. <laughs> I might. I might. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, when are you most productive during the day? Who? I would say I'm most productive during the day. Um, it's not early in the morning. It's not late at night. Uh, I'll probably <laughs> say around like right at, either right after lunch or right before it. So anywhere from like ten to twelve or like twelve to two. It's probably my sweet spot for me. It's like when I know that I'm up and I'm not sleepy. And I'm also, you know, still has a little bit of energy because it hasn't been a long day just yet. So between those hours, I would say, yeah. Wow, that's the opposite of me. That's when I'm sleepiest. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm usually ready to go. Great. And who is one person that inspires you? Your your biggest inspiration? Living or dead? Biggest inspiration, it changes from from time to time. Uh, I think right now, one of my biggest inspirations has been, um, I would say, uh, Derek Bell. He was a a lawyer, civil Mm -hmm. rights lawyer and law professor um, who uh, a lot of people can kind of call, you know, one of the uh, fathers of like critical race theory. Um, he, He wrote a lot and he wrote a book that I read just recently called Faces at the Bottom of the Well. Um... It really opened my eyes to, you know, how to transform uh, what we think of as civil rights right now. And it offers a new and different lens of how to look at traditional civil rights practices and how we can change those for the betterment of getting justice and things of that nature. So uh, Derek Bell was uh, really, really key to, you know, my learning experience while in graduate school uh, through articles and stuff like that. But that book was uh, really defining for sure. Wow, that's amazing. Um And if you could recommend a book to our listeners, what would a book. it be? What would it be? <laughs> oh, that's that's a good one because I I, I, I enjoy reading. Um, if there was a book that I could recommend, um, 
I guess it would depend on on what they were looking for. If it's fiction, I would recommend like a book like uh, um, The Vanishing Half, which is like a really really good book that I read you know about a year ago. Finished it in like a couple days. It was so good. Uh, but if it's like a more of a you know like a memoir or something like that, Kiese Lehman, yeah, he wrote a book called Heavy. Uh, it's really really good. Uh, he's a Southern writer from Mississippi. He's kind of just talking about his upbringing as a black man uh, growing up in Mississippi and things of that nature. But it ties in so much other things into it as well. And it just really brings it all together uh, because he's from the South and I'm from the South. So I was really able to, um, re- really able to, you know, sit with it more than anything else, you know, so heavy by K.S. and Lehman is a really, really good read. Amazing. I'm going to read that right away. Um, and the last question I have for you is if you could eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Chicken wings, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I think that was a fast answer to answer all the questions so far. So chicken wings, uh, my favorite <laughs> food. Everyone who knows me knows I love to meet some chicken wings. So definitely chicken wings. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That concludes our rapid fire round. We're going to move awesome. into the actual podcast now. Uh, and I'm dying to talk to you because we actually had our first conversation already, but I actually held back on a lot of my questions because I was like, okay, it's nice if I ask you on the actual podcast itself. So I'm just as new to you as all our listeners today. Mm. So the first thing I would like to ask is you mentioned that you were from the South. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood and yeah, just a little bit of the trajectory of your life? Uh, yeah, so my childhood was, uh, I would say I had a, a pretty good childhood. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. That's where I was born and raised. I uh, spent, you know, all of my you know, childhood years there up until I was in college and stuff like that. And so it was a place where, you know, uh, marked with a lot of history. Um, if you ever heard of Birmingham, Alabama, you've probably heard it associated with the civil rights movement in the U.S. and things of that nature. You know, people like Martin Luther King uh, and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of rich civil rights history um, still in Birmingham today. And so I'm kind of proud to be from a place where it was, uh, what you could say, a center of the movement in a way, uh, a gathering spot. Um, but you know, childhood was was good. I, I grew up. I have two younger brothers. Um, I grew up in the east side of Birmingham. Uh, usually, you know, for fun, what I did was, you know, watch football on the weekends with my with my brothers and, and eat chicken wings uh, and stuff like that while watching football games. And so, uh, I was a I was a kid that you know, in a way, I loved to be outside in the neighborhood. I, I can recall at times, you know, just with random you know friends from the neighborhood, we would always you know gather and, and play basketball. You know, either it was at my house or somebody else's house. We just walk to walk the neighborhood and just go shoot hoops all day uh, and, and drink water, and eat popsicles and stuff like that. And so it was uh, it was what you would, you know, pretty much associate with, I guess, any place. But, um, you know, it was it was it was good. And I guess where I, I guess growing up, I really didn't have a, a natural affinity to the environment or anything like that. I actually wasn't even thinking at all, at all about the environment. Uh, but I was also involved in a lot of other things, such as, you know, I played chess, you know, I was, I wrote essays for like competitions and stuff like that growing up. Uh, I played, you know, baseball, I played sports and, and different things like that. But I would say that my parents were, I'm really grateful for them because they got me involved in a, a lot of different things or it got me introduced to a lot of different things very early uh, in different arenas. So not only sports, but academically. Uh, and things like that can help you mentally and stuff like that. And so I was really, really uh, looking back on it. I'm really grateful for, you know, that part of my childhood and stuff like that. Um, but it wasn't until I guess I entered, you know, undergrad where I really started to gain this, uh, you know, I guess, like for the environment. I wouldn't necessarily say it was a love at this point because I still didn't know a lot. Um, and that was an interesting thing in itself because, you know, when I was in high school, um, I used to run track and I really wanted to run track when I got to college and stuff like that. Uh, but I hated practicing, which is a, a, something <laughs> that a lot of people don't know about me. So I, I kind of wanted to run for the love of it, but didn't want to run because I didn't want to practice, you know. And so as I'm, you know, you know, looking for colleges and stuff like that, of course, I'm getting recruited by a few schools, you know. It wasn't the, the greatest schools as far as like competition goes, but, you know, it was it was it was enough. You know, D1, D2, stuff like that. Um, but I, I get this email from Auburn University, which is where I eventually went to, to school. Uh, and they had this program 
for what they call Ag Elite, which is this program for students who are, uh, I guess, minority students who want to get into agriculture and stuff like that. And it interested me so much, this email, because usually I would get a lot of college spam from different different colleges that, you know, you probably get that same spam, which is like, hey, you know, they introduced their college and, you know, the highlights of it and stuff mm. like that. But this one was so different because it, it seems so streamlined and it seems so specific. Mm. And I was like, agriculture, I said, I really don't even know much about ar- agriculture. I guess the, the only thing I had tied to agriculture growing up was that my mom grew up in rural Alabama and she, you know, uh, and I have an uncle who, who farms a little bit and stuff like that. But the only thing I really knew about agriculture at this point in my life is like, you know, the thing that came to mind was like cows, dirt, you know what I'm saying, crops. I'm like, I don't know anything about this. But I was just so interested. So I remember telling my parents, I was like, hey, so I got this email from Auburn. I kind of want to check it out. And so like a few weeks later, we went to go tour the school. Had a great time, you know, they really uh, made me feel like home. If you ever hear anything about Auburn University, uh, they call it like um, a family. And the Auburn, the Auburn family, and I, I could say that in a in a in a, in a way that's that's kind of real. I did kind of develop a family while I was there, and, and I'm very grateful for the friends I did did have. Um, but that's when I I kind of made that choice that this might be the school that I'll go to, because uh, I you know when I got there for the tour, I got to meet you know the dean of the College of Agriculture. I sat down with a few students and talked with them. Uh, learned a little bit more about the different majors that they offered and stuff like that. Then a few weeks later, we had this uh, this uh, this uh, scholarship ceremony, I guess you can call it. And so part of the Ag Elite Scholars Program is what it, I guess the real name for it. Uh, there's a scholarship attached to it. So to, in order to win the scholarship, you had to write an essay on you know different things. And so I was like, all right, I'll write this essay. I don't think I'm going to win it. I don't know anything about agriculture, but heck, I'm going to give it a try. Lo and behold, I actually win. And so... <laughs> That was really, I guess, the, the kickstarts that everything that's happened so far because that win kind of sealed the deal for me going to Auburn because I got the scholarship and one of the stipulations of that scholarship was you had to major within the College of Agriculture at Auburn. And so now I had to kind of find a major that kind of spoke to me the most. And that major was agricultural business economics um, because of my uh, interest, I guess, in economics, being familiar with, um, with business and things of that nature. Um, and how it was also associated with policy and politics, which is one of my uh, really, really uh, good interests and stuff like that. And so um, that's what led me to Auburn. And eventually, you know, going through Auburn and stuff like that is what led me to Yale and to, and to where I am today. It's crazy how those thoughts can kind of connect like that, you know. Amazing. The, the two, yeah. the key takeaways I got from that, I mean, of course, there were many, but the two things that strike me the most were the, the, the one thing where you mentioned that you... Uh, wanted to be a runner but you didn't like to practice and I really resonated yeah. with that because <laughs> I yeah, had the same yeah, thing uh, with dancing like I my mom put me into a dance class and I really yeah. I, I wanted to dance but I didn't want to practice <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and the other thing that uh, struck me was that you had you had an angel on your shoulder when you wrote that essay that it just sort of yeah put everything into motion into where you are today yeah yeah I would say that that angel has been on my shoulder for pretty much all, all you know for, I've noticed it at least for the past few years because it, it's what I guess got me to Auburn when I didn't think I would go to Auburn at one point like if you would have asked me during my senior year of high school before I was applying to colleges that I go to Auburn University and major in agricultural economics I would just call you crazy because I was like first of all I don't know what that <laughs> is you know and so it's re- it was just really crazy how I you know came to you know major in that and stay in that same major for all four years of undergrad and you know, even while I was an undergrad, I wanted to go to law school right out. And somehow an angel on my shoulder, you know, led me to go to Yale and get a degree in, you know, environmental management. And at the time, I really didn't know much about that either, you know. And so my life, I guess the, the events of my life have always happened to be, you know, that angel on my shoulder, just kind of nudging me into certain directions, but also being there and being able to provide for me as well. So I'm really grateful. Yeah. Amazing. And uh, when we first talked, you had mentioned that you wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Um, yeah, yeah. And so how did Yale fit into that sort of story at, or that interest? Yeah, so I've always wanted to be kind of involved in some type of justice movement. I guess as a kid, I've always been so infatuated with 
I was really infatuated with the civil rights movement, really infatuated with politics, but all, but really politics as it pertained to local communities. Um, but I, you know, growing up, I just saw how uh, politics and laws kind of just affected people people's lives. Some for the good, some for the for the worse. And I wanted to be a part of the change, be one of the change agents, you know, of you know, you know, social justice movements and stuff like that. Um, so when I was at Yale. Um, and I guess this story really starts the summer before Yale yeah, because this is what really introduced me to you know what I'm focused on today, more than anything else. So I read this book called Toxic Communities by uh, Dr. Dorsetti Taylor, who uh, you know would end up being one of my uh, professors at Yale. Actually, um, at the time that she wrote this book, and at the time that I read it, she was at Michigan, uh, you know, as a professor. But she came to Yale during my last year, and I was fortunate to be able to take one of her classes and, and be a fellow during the, uh, the summer going into, you know, Berkeley. Um, but the book really spoke a lot about, you know, how a lot of black communities are in close proximity to things like landfills and petrochemical plants and how this affects, you know, the air quality, the water quality, the quality of life for mm. black people and people of wow. color, other, other people of color uh, in the US. And what really struck me about it is not only did I not know these things as, you know, that were in the book, by how prevalent these issues were in the state of Alabama. This is a state where I grew up, a state that, you know, despite all of its flaws, a state that I, that I really, really love, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, you know, you, if you love something enough, you, you, you choose to um, want to do everything that you can to, to, to make it better, right? I think James Baldwin said one time that, you know, I'm paraphrasing, so I may actually mess this quote up a little bit, but he basically <laughs> was saying in a way, if you love something so much, you know, uh, you can you choose you can critique it in any way you see fit, because that critiquing itself is loving it. So you're being able to tell it that hard truth to get it to understand that hey we got to change right. And so that's how I kind of feel about the state of Alabama and the things that go on there. And so as I'm reading this book, I'm just like wow man this is like this stuff was happening in like my own backyard and I didn't even know about it you know. And so what well, as I got to graduate school. That was kind of one of, that's what I wanted to be my focus. I said, I want to focus on these issues here. I want to be able to learn more about these environmental justice issues happening in the South, happening in the state of Alabama. Because one day I want to be rooted in this, in these issues and being able to be one, again, one of the change agents. And the only way I could really see how to do that for myself, given my interest in law and things of that nature, was to go to law school and become a, become a lawyer. But I would say that while I was at Yale in graduate school, I was really fortunate because I was able to study law, you know, lightly, of course, um, for classes and different courses that I took. But also I was a research assistant for a lawyer, which was really, really cool. Wow. And it was, it's, it's crazy how the stars have aligned in my life because um, she was, at the time that I became a, a research assistant for her, the position was to do work in Alabama, uh, to research in Alabama, basically looking at this community in rural Alabama, and we were looking at uh, how civil rights laws kind of affected the environmental justice outcomes uh, in, in, that, in that arena. And it was just so interesting because it was like, whoa, I just read about these things like this summer. And it's just so crazy how this position, you know, crossed my, you know, came across my airwaves uh, and I was able to, you know, do it. You know, I remember getting on the phone with her name is um, uh, Mary Eagle Manlato. She works for the Biden administration now in the, in the Office of General Counsel at, uh, at the EPA. Uh, but I was able to do this case study with her and, and things of that nature. And I finally found exactly what the case study was. It's a case study of, you know, the application of civil rights law um, to environmental justice claims made by community residents in this small uh, community in Alabama. And it was just, you know, it was just really amazing just to be able to be a part of that because not only did it open my eyes to the issues that I wanted to study, but it gave me a new lens to look at it through, which was the lens of law, but also applying the lens of environmental policy and environmental, environmental law um, and environmental justice as well. She's been in this arena, Ms. Uh, Professor Ingrid Lotto, for, for decades fighting these types of issues, um, not only in Alabama, but in different parts of the South. And so to kind of witness her at work in a way, as a research assistant, you know, writing and, and, and researching and stuff like that, you know, I was able to kind of emulate some of those same things that she did. I was able to meet people in those communities. 
I was able to even go back to Alabama, you know, but this is before COVID. And so I was able to go back to Alabama and actually, you know, go door to door and, and talk to people about, you know, the things wow. that they were dealing with. Because there was a landfill that was, you know, pretty much centralized in that in that community. And this is a community that was there uh, since the Reconstruction period. So these black people have been there. Their ancestors have been there since Reconstruction, right after slavery. Um, and they were able to, you know, acquire land and keep that land and stuff like that. And now all of a sudden, you know, a few decades ago, there's this, you know, company that wants to come in and build a landfill. And it, this landfill is basically in a way degrading the land that's there. This is black owned historic land, you know? And so, you know, there, of course there's gonna be community opposition to it because not only does it smells, but it can affect the air quality. It can affect the water quality. And again, like I said, it affects the quality of life health wise, right? Because you kind of need those two things water and air yeah. to be you know of high grade in order to 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 live you know cleanly and live healthily and yeah. stuff like that exactly um and so it was just it was just really invigorating i guess to be able to work in that arena and that's what really opened my eyes to okay i'm kind of glad i didn't go to law school when i did because i was able to learn a little bit more as to exactly why i wanted to to find a little niche area to kind of work in as i was you know uh, working towards going to law school at some point and stuff like that. Um, and so I would say that that was, that was the, the kind of the highlight for me was being able to be that research assistant for Professor Ingmar Lotto. But also besides that, meet people like Professor Gerald Torres, who's huge in the field of environmental justice and environmental policy and law. Um, I was able to be a, you know, a teaching fellow for him for critical race theory at, the, at Yale Law School and stuff like that. Uh, wow. and just be able to meet different people at school and stuff like that who have worked in these fields, you know, prior to coming to school or also had similar interests, but that interest has been there for them much longer than it was there for me. So to be able to learn from them as well, my peers was also really just really amazing. Um, and so I'm just really, at the end of the day, I'm just so grateful for, you know, all the experience and everything I've been through up until this point, because yeah. it's given me a new vision on, you know, why I do want to go to law school, why I do want to become a civil rights lawyer, and eventually why I want to be rooted in the South again, so. Amazing. Yeah. That honestly sounds like such a great experience. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to understand, so you're currently a fellow at Berkeley, a ph philanthropy fellow? Yeah, so I'm doing, a, uh, I guess the, the, the term for it is uh, Packard Philanthropy Fellow at UC Berkeley High School of Business, yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the first thing I remember <clears throat> I asked you when I met you was, what is a fellow? What is a fellow? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I, I remembered you asked me that. And so the other day I said, I'm going to look up and see what the actual definition is of a fellow. Um, and, you know, so I was still stuck, you know, because it's like, okay, it's just like they just gave this moniker here to signify something. But essentially what I do is, um, I guess a fellow or this fellowship, academic fellowship, uh, is to do exploratory research and stuff like that. So I have, I get paid through the University of Berkeley. I'm an employee of, of Berkeley, but I work with uh, this philanthropic or grant making foundation here in uh, the South Bay of California. So it's about uh, 50 minutes away from the actual campus of Berkeley where I, where I actually do my work and stuff like that. Um, but I'm placed there through the fellowship. And so uh, I guess that's where I kind of, working for this foundation, the David and Lucille Pack Foundation. Uh, I do exploratory research on different projects of how can we support, you know, different, you know, grant proposals or projects in different areas of the country. So for the Packer Foundation as a, I guess the title that I have there is a program research analyst. It makes mm. sense, right? Because I'm doing research. Um, and I work mainly across these three projects on the climate and land team. Uh, the three projects are agriculture, livelihoods, and conservation, uh, bioenergy, and uh, palm oil strategies. And so these are different grant making strategies that the, there's of course many more strategies that they have, but I, I work across these three strategies, uh, grant making strategies these are um, in places like Ethiopia, Indonesia, uh, and the US. And what's really cool about, you know, the, the strategies that I, that I work on is that the work is so pertinent on, um, well, the foundation itself is having a better focus on justice and equity, which mm. is something I was kind of looking for when I was looking for, you know, jobs and stuff like that. And kind of one of the reasons why I applied because I was able to talk to, you know, past fellows about their experience and stuff like that. And, um, 
that really you know opened my eyes to a lot. So it's been it's been a it's been a good ride, you know, being able to right. to work here so far and kind of have to focus on things. And what's really cool is that you know right now one of the projects that I'm focused on is, uh, or some of the exploratory research that I'm doing, aligns with a lot of the stuff I, I focus on in grad school, which was black farmers and, and, and black land ownership, black land tenure in the rural south. I love the rural south, and so being able to actually focus on that through this fellowship through this fellowship has been amazing because it's given me the space to, you know, learn more about these issues in this issue area. But it also allows me the the room to in the space to to write about it in a, in a deep way and, and to, you know, formulate different visions and stuff like that. Um, and it's allowed me to see how the dots in my life have kind of connected as far as, you know, what I did at Auburn and what I did at Yale and what I'm doing now and what I can do post this fellowship, uh, whether it would be whether it be law school or anything else. And how that can now, now I can kind of see the path that I'm on and see you know it's really cool just to to see how the dots in your work kind of connect over time because yeah. it leads you to new things and so yeah this fellowship has been really great and but That's yeah amazing. fellowship uh, it's an exploratory research you get paid to just read yeah. and write and do projects it's pretty cool stuff <laughs> yeah super cool I mean there's so much I want to <clears throat> ask you and so much I also don't know about the rural south but just a lot of the things yeah. you mentioned. Um, but one of the main questions that I also had was, um, because from the outside, when I first came across your profile on LinkedIn, um, I immediately was like, okay, he's an environmentalist because uh, of just your background and all the things that you mentioned. But I wanted to ask yeah. you, do you identify as an environmentalist? Do you consider yourself an <clears throat> environmentalist? That's a good question. That's a really good question. <laughs> I think we, we had a, a small conversation about this previously, uh, the last yeah. time we talked, and I kind of said that, you know, I think going into grad school, I had a, a specific, I guess, frame of reference of what a what an environmentalist, environmentalist was to me. And the first things that usually would come to mind when I thought of an environmentalist was like a white person going on a hike or a white person in nature, right? You know, uh, 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 Thoreau, for example, or something like that. You know, you, you, you probably heard of Thoreau. And, uh, his works and stuff like that of him being in nature and stuff. So that's kind of what came to mind for me, Henry David Thoreau. Um, and so as I'm going through grad school, you know, I was, I'm so glad that I've had the experiences that I've had and met the people that I did meet because it really opened my eyes and transformed my thinking on what environmentalism and what an environmentalist can be. Uh, they can be black. They can yeah. be, they can be, they can. they can be, you know, people of color. They can be queer, you know, um, and different things and so it was it was really just um man I, I i keep saying this but i'm just so grateful for you know having that unlearning process mm -hmm. and that renewal that that learning process as well as to you know what environmentalism can mean and so now the vision that i have and the way that i think about environmentalism and what i call myself an environmentalist in a way i would say yes because i do have a focus specifically on the environment and that's how to make it better um, how to clean up climate change, um, how to gain or, you know, achieve environmental justice per se in different arenas. Even though I may want to work in this small niche area in the rural South dealing with black communities and black land and, and, and that type of thing, it's environmental um, because I'm dealing with different parts of the environment. I would say, you know, air quality, water quality, again, quality of life, uh, you know, access to, to land. Uh, the reemergence, aiding the reemergence of black farmers in the rural south, mm. um, and things of that nature, and how they tend to land and stuff like that. I would say that black people are natural agrarians, which means that we we are naturally, you know, uh, able to, you know, uh, we have natural ties to to land and things of that nature, as far as you know, growing crops and those types of things. And I'm not just talking about because of our ties to slavery and stuff like that, but even you know before that, before we even came to America, or that came, but before we even were, you know, uprooted from our homes and brought to America, you know what I'm saying? We, we were intending to land in a sustainable way, you know, and it's really cool that I've been able to learn about those things, you know, throughout grad school and just through my own reading and, and stuff like that. Uh, but those people are environmentalists too, and they've been environmentalists all along. They, these were environmentalists before the environmentalist term became, became popular. And so, you know, understanding that is understanding that anybody really can be an environmentalist if they so choose. Uh, 
You don't have to necessarily be a person that loves the outdoors. You don't have to have to, you know, love to hike and love to rock climb and, and, and you know, bike in, in the woods and, and, and camp and all that good stuff to be an environmentalist. You can be an environmentalist from home by, you know, having a, a eye and an ear towards uh, climate justice and environmental justice, you know, through your reading, through your through your writing and being a part of different organizations and volunteering and stuff like that uh, for the betterment of, of people, for the betterment of the ecosystem and biodiversity and things of that nature. Um, yeah. And so for, for those reasons uh, in particular, I would say that I'm an environmentalist and so many people who the people, so many people who society wouldn't commonly associate with that term are environmentalists too. Um, and that's something to, to, to be proud of, you know, uh, to take a little bit of pride in and try to, you know, break down that barrier uh, of what environmentalism used to be. Yeah. And you mentioned like you, this, that unlearning process for you, like to the experiences that you've had at Yale and Berkeley, um, at Auburn University. Um, do you think if you didn't have any of that, if you didn't go through the same trajectory of like these universities studying uh, agriculture and then going to environmental management, would you mm -hmm. still consider yourself an environmentalist? Nah, no, not <laughs> at all. Not at all. I'm a person okay. that uh, believes in like all things happen for a reason, defined timing. And so I would say, I know this is not the question you asked, but if, you know, I've, I've definitely had questions of if you could have done it different, would you have done it different? And my answer is always no, because I just don't know if I was still different, if I was still end up yeah. being the same person I am today. I would have had the same experiences I've had, you know, over time mm. and stuff like that. Mm. But to answer the question, no, I definitely wouldn't consider myself an environmentalist then because I wouldn't probably, I probably wouldn't even be uh, remotely close to working in the environmental space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be quite honest with you, I thought I was going to go, you know, work in politics and, and stuff like that. And I even think about how that even connected to the environment in any, any way. So, no. Nah. That's, that's really interesting because... Um, the reason I ask is, of course, as you know, like, there's just so much, which you had as well, there's just all this like stereotype and prejudice against the term. Mm -hmm. It's a term that people yeah. are afraid to use quite a lot, uh, or to label themselves with. And so the reason I ask is, um, yeah, for people who aren't doing the same things, who aren't being, who aren't studying environmentalism, or who aren't like working with it on an everyday basis, how do they, do you think that there's a space for them to still find that label or just to find that identity where if you if you can be for instance like i mean i feel like there are certain jobs that inherently <clears throat> have this environmentalism in it like being a civil rights lawyer uh, you can very easily relate it to the environment um okay. being a being an environmentalist being a um, yeah climate justice person but what about people who are accountants or who are you know who are studying things that are so diametrically opposed to what we believe is environmentalism do you think that there's a space for that? Because th and that's why I asked why, if you would mm -hmm. feel that way, if you didn't have the same trajectory, like if you were a track and field runner and then you became an athlete, like how would yeah yeah how would you have approached that maybe? Yeah, I think knowing what I know now about what environmentalism can be, I think there's always space for people like that to be to be to call themselves environmentalists if they so choose, you know. The word itself is a social construct. So, I mean, we can make it mean anything that we want, right? And so, you know, it doesn't, like I said, you don't have to be, you know, ingrained in the environment to to be dubbed an environmentalist. You just got to be able to love it. I'd love it enough to take care of it. Love it enough to to want to see it, you know, survive and to see it flourish. Love it uh, enough to critique to it. <laughs> Love, love it enough to critique it as well. Love it enough to critique it. That's probably one of the biggest things. Um, and if, if you if you can find that love for it, no matter what you do, no matter what you study, no matter no matter you know what your interests may be, then in a way, I think you you have an environmental tint to you, and you might not know it. It might not be a natural affinity. Like I said, I didn't grow up, you know, thinking that I would get into environmentalism. Mm -hmm. um, into environmental justice and the things that I'm focused on now, but it came and developed. It developed itself over time within me. It was always there. Actually, it just needed to be revealed, and it may just be a thing where there's environmentalism in each and every one of us. Each and every one of us, I think, you know, a little bit wants to take care of the environment that we have, right? Uh, because it, the word environment can be used to mean different things. It can mean nature. It can mean the home environment, the work environment, and things of that nature. Um, 
and I know that we don't associate the term environmentalism with those types of ways that we associate the environment in different ways like that. Uh, but to think about it that way, you know, is making space. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, you know, just kind of having that, that love for, you know, wanting to see the environment flourish, mm. wanting to see clean air, wanting to have clean water, uh, wanting to see people live uh, in, in nice uh, neighborhoods that aren't blighted and things of that nature due to, you know, years of, of racism and discrimination and, and being in close proximity to, to, to greed and, and how capitalism has, has been rooted all in that as well. I'm talking about, uh, you know, landfills and, you know, petrochemical plants and, and different mm. things like that. But, you know, I think it's all about that love at the end of the day, just loving, loving, you know, loving, not necessarily loving nature, but just loving, wanting to see this world, this earth, uh, better at the end of the day, I guess. That's yeah. amazing. I think you have like a wealth of knowledge that I can just keep drawing from. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate um, that. Sometimes I don't think so, but I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and just because I'm curious, I'm going to ask you one last question. Okay. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to know, like, what do you, how do you feel? And this is a very broad, very vague, open-ended question. So feel free to not answer if you feel like, oh, this is too much for me to unpack. But um, I just, I'm curious, what, how do you feel about just this whole environmental movement, this whole climate change movement? And where do you see this label fitting in? Like, do you think, like, changing people's perspectives, like, like, like you said, like environmentalism is a social construct, like the term environmentalist is socially constructed. Do you think that changing this word and actually empowering people to use it um, in a different way could actually affect the environmental movement? Or do you think that things need to happen in a different way? Like just from your experience with it, where do you think the biggest problem lies with us not as a, like a society not moving forward in a good way with this movement? Or do you think we are? <laughs> Well, I would say that the environmental movement is somewhat different than the environmental justice movement or the climate mm. justice movement, which I usually associate myself with more than the environmental movement. Mm. Because to me, the, the environmental movement, and you know, I could be wrong, but this is just, I guess, the uh, my thinking on it as far as you know what I've looked at and what I've studied is that the environmental movement is, is a little bit different. Mm. Um, it has a has a wider tint to it in the climate justice and the environmental justice movements themselves. Um, and I saw I think that as we continue to grow the term environmentalism and allow, like I said, like you said, that that space for people who uh, may be accountants and things like that, but they have this love for you know the environment into this space. Um, I think it will kind of change the tides a little bit. I'm very confident in in the environmental justice and climate justice movements um, that I've seen via my Twitter feed, via, you know, being in contact with people, via my own organizing and stuff like that uh, in my own spaces uh, for the future. Um, climate change now has become one of the, the, the biggest, you know, uh, top of mind issue areas, mainstream issue areas uh, in politics today which has not always been the case. Environmental justice, greatly enough, has become a, a top of my issue as well. And a lot of people are starting to learn more about environmental justice and climate justice movements and stuff. And I think that as we all, as the environmental justice and climate justice movement grows, it will bring people in who have fresh ideas, uh, fresh points of view that we all need, because I think we all deserve critique and constructive critique and stuff like that in order to better ourselves. Um, and so that's something that I think um, we can definitely, you know, look at with a lot of with a lot of pride and, and be genuine in. One thing I've always, you know, I've read this a few years ago is a quote that, you know, I've always kind of stuck with me is that, you know, within the environmental justice movements, we don't all have to be uniform to be united. You know what I'm saying? So though we may have different focuses, different experiences, different backgrounds, and we have different uh, goals within the movement and stuff like that, we can still be on a united front as to what it is we want to achieve, a clean and healthy world so that we can have a healthy population, healthy biodiversity, a healthy ecosystem, and be one with nature in a way for all people, you know what I'm saying? Not just rich, wealthy white people, you know what I'm saying? not just for the global north, but also for the global south um, and, and things of that nature. And so understanding that 
then that allows people who may be a little bit reluctant, a little bit on the fence of, you know, if they may call that stuff their term or be a part of that movement because they don't feel like they know enough mm. to be a part of it. Because at the end of the day, you're assisting, you're helping, you know what I'm saying? You're bringing, again, that fresh viewpoint that we yeah. might not even know about, that you know about through your own personal experience, you know, and things of that nature. And wow. so understanding that we can all be united even though we don't have to be the same, we don't have to be uniform, we don't have to be the exact same and be focused on the exact same things. We can be united in saying, you know what? We want wow. to see a better world for ourselves and for our, for our future generations. We wow. want a better climate future for our you know, future generations yeah. and stuff like that. Is that your and quote? We don't have to be uniform to be united. I love that. It's, it's, I read it in a book. Uh, <laughs> so it's not necessarily my quote, but... Um, yeah. I love that. I resonate it's with that It's a quote so that much. I really, really love. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I think a lot of our listeners will also resonate with that because as a South Indian, I also see that, yeah, I don't have to be the same as other environmentalists to be part of this mm -hmm. movement, to be a part of this united fund. That's amazing. You can't be. Yeah. You can't be the same, you know, because we all have, we're all different. We're all different. We're all unique. We have, we grew up differently. We grew up in different spaces and, and different cultures and and so because of that, we have different needs and, and different necessities, different desires, right? Uh, but it's all of it. All of it is rooted in seeing justice achieved. All of it is rooted in seeing a, a clean climate future for future generations and stuff like that. Um, but it's just, in, a di it's just in, in different ways. So we can always be, we don't have to be uniform, but we can definitely be united for sure. For Amazing. Sure. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, of course. Usually I round off the podcast by asking um, our, our guests, like, what advice they would give to people who are, you know, stepping their waters into the environmental world or who are afraid to label themselves as that. And I think you already mm -hmm. did it in so many ways. You already said so many things that I think resonate with people. Um, but I would like to ask you, like, if you have any, like, yeah, advice or anything that you would give to people who aren't who are afraid to use that word. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I think my advice would be don't let nobody tell you that you're not if you feel like you are. Um, if you really feel like you are, if you, like I said, if you had that love for things, even if you're not able to articulate it in the right way as some people do, you know, uh, when I was in graduate school, there was things that, you know, I had a love for and I had an interest in, but I couldn't fully articulate it like some of my classmates. And that was okay. That doesn't mean that that love was, you know, any less, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And so I, I had to, I had to really understand that even though I had this imposter syndrome while I, in graduate school, in a way, uh, I wasn't even going to let, no, I wasn't going to let nobody tell me no. I wasn't going to let nobody steer me wrong. I wasn't going to let nobody try to, you know, doubt me or anything like that. And so that would be my advice is to like, look, if you have this love and you know, you have it within you, um, even if you're not studying these things every single day, but you're reading on it and you know stuff like that that you're that you're interested in these issues that you see on on the tv when it deals with climate change and stuff like that uh even if you're gardening making a little garden <laughs> inside your home hydroponics or you know uh if you're doing you know gardening in your backyard and stuff like that and you feel you feel a, a, in a way a tie to that nature then if you want to call yourself environmentalist by all means be that person and you know continue to have that love for it and i guarantee there would be people that would probably tell you or try to try to test you on your environmental knowledge but forget them man you know what i'm saying like those people are going i mean that's in any arena not just the environment people are always going to be able to try to challenge you or try to tell you that you don't know enough and that you aren't worthy of being in this space uh but you know none of that's true um, i would just say you know, just continue to be yourself Continue to love yourself and love what you do and, you know, keep people in your corner that, that, will, that will support you and, and, and what you do and what you say you do. And I think you'll be okay. Yeah, that's amazing. Although we're like, I'm only viewing you through a Zoom, Zoom screen, I really feel that yeah. love that you have for yourself as well, that you've grown into that. Uh, that's amazing. Okay, we're going to end on that note, that lovely note. Um, thank you again, Cam, for being here uh, all the way thank from you. San Francisco. <laughs> uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, giving us your amazing input. Um, and for everyone listening in, uh, yeah, if you have any more questions, please send it to our Instagram. And I'm sure Cam will be happy to 
enter any of them, hopefully. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, for, sure. Um, for sure. You can also watch this uh, podcast on YouTube. So please, if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. I always hate doing this, but yeah, it really helps us give you better stories. And also have a look at our website. Our first edition of the magazine is coming out soon. So keep an eye on that as well. And yeah, and this is the final episode of season one uh, of A Labor of Love. And I'm really, really happy that it was you, Cam. So thank you, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you for, for having me. I was so, like I said, it was so crazy to see uh, the DM that you sent me on LinkedIn and invited me to be on here. And I'm so glad that I, I, I was able to open it and catch it in time because my notification for LinkedIn are actually not on. So I checked it every so often. And so when I checked it and saw it, you know, I was like, wow, this is crazy. This is great. I, I would love to do this. And so it's been a, a real pleasure. So thank you for having me. This has been, this has been really great. Amazing. The stars were aligned. It was meant to happen. <laughs> of course. Of course. Okay. Great, everyone. Thank you for listening in and I'll catch you for season two.